The images we see and the stories we hear through the medium of films and TV series hold the power to shape our hearts, our minds, and indeed, our very souls. Movies and TV series are powerful mediums indeed wielding an influence over culture and society that is unparalleled in human history. They can uplift, entertain, educate, and inspire, yet they also possess the potential to mislead, to degrade, and to desensitize us to the values that we uphold in the Holy Scriptures. In the midst of the various genres of films and TV series, the genre of horror films and series stands out, not just in its popularity among audiences worldwide, but also in its profitability for those who produce such works. Consider the example of Paranormal Activity, a film produced with a meager budget of approximately $15,000, yet it garnered over $193 million at the box office worldwide. This staggering figure is often cited as a testament to the film's massive return on investment, highlighting the immense draw of horror films to the masses. Yet, as followers of Christ, we are called to a higher standard, to set our sights not on the things of this world, but on the things above. Many of the films produced today, including those outside the traditionally frightening horror genre, stand in stark opposition to Christian values, or, at the very least, diverge from God's divine standard of holiness. It is a saddening truth that in their quest to entertain, many movies resort to themes and narratives that clash with the teachings of our Lord and Savior, themes that glorify sin, promote fear, and often delve into the occult or the macabre. The question then arises, what is the allure of horror films and films dealing with the occult? For many, especially the young and impressionable, these movies satisfy an urge to experience fear in a controlled environment. It is a way to feel alive, to test one's boundaries in the safety of a movie theater or behind the light of a television screen. Yet, this entertainment value comes at a cost. It numbs our sensitivity to suffering, to evil, and to the spiritual warfare that rages unseen around us. Take, for instance, witchcraft. Witchcraft in the Bible is something that is expressly forbidden. The Bible extensively addresses the topic of witchcraft, grouping it with similar practices like fortune-telling and necromancy as deceptive imitations of true spirituality. Such activities are firmly denounced throughout Scripture, highlighting a clear stance against all manifestations of witchcraft. These practices, steeped in the pursuit of knowledge and power through supernatural means outside of God's provision, are seen as pathways that lead individuals away from reliance on and faith in the Almighty. Scriptures such as Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 10 to 12 provide clear guidance on this matter, stating, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. This passage not only enumerates the various practices considered abhorrent, but also underscores the severity with which God views the turn towards these dark arts. It is a redirection of trust from God's wisdom and timing to the manipulation of forces that seek to undermine His divine order and will. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5, 19, 21 includes witchcraft or sorcery, as it is sometimes translated, in the list of the works of the flesh that are incompatible with the kingdom of God. This inclusion further emphasizes that engaging in such practices not only estranges individuals from God, but also entangles them in behaviors that are diametrically opposed to the fruits of the Spirit. The contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit outlined in the subsequent verses highlights the vast gulf between the two paths, urging believers to live by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. We are living in an age that is increasingly becoming more and more desensitized to sin, an age where people are getting increasingly desensitized to things that God has categorically forbidden us from participating in. This is why we live in an age that encourages and endorses witchcraft, a world where we are desensitized to things that God himself forbids us to get involved in. Now think, if you were Lucifer, with the amount of TV series, films, and streaming people do, would you not use these means to push your own agenda?
According to Nielsen's The Gauge, a snapshot of U.S. consumer viewing behavior, the average American spent around three to four hours per day watching live television and streaming content. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. This passage teaches us several things about demons. First, we see that demons desire a human host and look for a place among the empty, seeing it as an invitation. When a person is spiritually empty and unoccupied, they become vulnerable to a demonic possession. However, I would like to pause here to show you the character and audacious nature of unclean spirits. The unclean spirit states, quote, I will return into my house from whence I came out. The unclean spirit is referring to the human body as his house, although he didn't create it. He is referring to the human body as his house, although he didn't buy it and has no claim to the human body. He is referring to it as his house. That right there is the nature of evil spirits. And to a further point, it is the nature of Lucifer, the fallen one. Remember, Lucifer wanted the worship and adoration of God, which he did not deserve and did not have any right to. I will return into my house from whence I came out. This statement is the height of audacity. Second, we see that demons do not give up easily. When they are cast out of a person, they do not simply disappear. Instead, they seek to return to their former host. They consider the empty house an invitation to return. To some extent, this reveals to us that unclean spirits watch and observe. They watch and observe. Third, we see that demons are not satisfied with just one host. When the unclean spirit returns, it finds the man unoccupied, swept, and put in order. The man is spiritually empty and unoccupied. Jesus says that the house is swept and put in order to indicate that the man is ready to be reoccupied. His house is ready to be moved into once again. But the unclean spirit does not immediately move in as we might expect it to do. This should reveal to us how calculated unclean spirits are. They are beings that think, ponder, and calculate. Instead of immediately entering, it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. Instead of moving in immediately, it finds other demon friends more wicked than itself, and then they all possess the man together. From this, we can see the cohesive nature of the kingdom of evil. They work together. They are a unified team able to work together and cohabitate. Furthermore, we also see that this evil spirit gets spirits more wicked than himself. All demons are not the same. This passage of scripture somewhat suggests there are levels to the wickedness of demons. Some demons are more wicked than others. We also see in the Bible that spirits can affect our world. Both angels and demons have the power to cause the supernatural to happen. We see in the book of Revelation where angels cause a great deal of occurrences to happen here on earth. Angels and demons can directly affect this world. Look at what the devil did to the life of Job. I remember a pastor preaching on this subject a little while ago. He spoke of his experience about a blockbuster horror movie which came out in the 70s. If I were to name the movie, undoubtedly you would have heard of it. He spoke of how he warned his congregation specifically not to watch it. But unfortunately, not everyone listened. It just scared me to death. Things just like this, just, it just scared, really scared me to death. I'm just nervous. Do you remember what particular scene it was that... Uh, when that she was in, what was it? When she was in a room, the doctors came in, and she was, when, I guess it was when she was talking to Devil's Voice. Oh. Oh. 
I remember a pastor preaching on this subject a little while ago. He spoke of his experience about a blockbuster horror movie which came out in the 70s. If I were to name the movie, you would have undoubtedly heard of it. He spoke of how he warned his congregation specifically not to go watch it. But unfortunately, not everyone listened. A young lady in his congregation went to watch. She was an astonishing young lady. She went to that movie and as she was watching that film, something entered her. She went home and told her mother, I don't feel the same anymore. When I was watching that film, mum, something entered me. Her parents brushed it off and told her not to worry about it. And that night, the family experienced strange paranormal behavior in their home. They experienced things in their house that they had never experienced before. In the middle of the night, whatever entered her started to manifest. My experience with this movie has been incredible, especially with people fainting. Uh, halfway through the movie, it starts. the movie starts getting quite uh, uh, violent and uh, people get quite unusual reactions and we have a lot of people throwing up and a lot of people shuddering but the thing that really surprises me is people faint I mean I've never in my life known a movie where people would faint I mean it's hard to make people faint in the landscape of modern media consumption where the average individual is immersed in a sea of narratives for several hours a day the potential for influence is immense if one were to assume the perspective of Lucifer seeking to sway hearts and minds away from divine teachings and moral righteousness, the utilization of media as a tool to push one's own agenda would not only be tempting, but strategically shrewd. In this era of unparalleled media consumption, where television, films, and streaming content command the attention of billions around the globe, the power of these platforms cannot be overstated. They shape perceptions, influence opinions, and subtly guide the moral compass of society. If I were Lucifer, the strategy would be clear. Infiltrate these powerful mediums to sow seeds of doubt, normalize sin, and gradually erode the fabric of spiritual belief and moral clarity. Consider the subtle ways in which media can influence by glamorizing lifestyles and choices that contravene biblical teachings, by trivializing sin until it becomes a source of entertainment rather than a cause for repentance, and by promoting narratives that challenge the sovereignty of God, encouraging reliance on self or on the tangible and temporal rather than the eternal and divine. The media's ability to desensitize audiences to sin, as highlighted previously, serves this agenda by making the forbidden seem familiar and thus less forbidden. By incorporating themes that contradict God's commandments into mainstream entertainment, a figure like Lucifer would be playing a long game aiming not for immediate conversion to evil, but for a gradual shift in societal norms and values. Over time, what was once considered taboo or morally reprehensible becomes accepted, even celebrated, under the guise of progress, freedom of expression, or artistic exploration. Moreover, the omnipresence of media today, with its ability to reach into every home and influence every age group, presents an unparalleled opportunity to cast a wide net over society. The narratives spun across myriad shows, movies, and streaming services create a tapestry of influence that can subtly shift the moral and spiritual ground beneath an entire population's feet. In this hypothetical scenario, where I embody the mindset of Lucifer, exploiting the narrative power of media would also involve undermining the sources of spiritual strength and community. By promoting individualism and skepticism towards organized religion and spiritual authority, these narratives would weaken the bonds that tie communities of faith together, isolating individuals and making them more susceptible to deception. Furthermore, the strategy would not be limited to overtly anti-religious content. It would also involve the promotion of apathy, materialism, and a preoccupation with the self. By filling individuals' lives with distractions, anxieties, and superficial needs, the deeper questions about purpose, morality, and eternity are pushed to the margins of consciousness, 
leaving less room for spiritual reflection and growth. Let us not forget the words of the Apostle Paul, who in his letter to the Philippians exhorts us to focus on whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and praiseworthy. In a world captivated by the flickering lights of the cinema, let us be beacons of light that shine forth the truth, love, and peace of Jesus Christ. Let us choose wisely the stories we allow into our hearts, for they have the power to shape our character, influence our beliefs, and ultimately determine our destiny. In conclusion, while movies remain a powerful medium with a profound impact on culture, let us be guided by our faith and our commitment to God's divine standard of holiness. Let us seek out films that uplift and inspire, that challenge us to grow in love and understanding, and that reinforce the values we hold dear as followers of Christ. In doing so, we not only protect our own hearts and minds, but also bear witness to the transformative power of God's love in a world in desperate need of His grace.